Today I'm going to be doing an acrylic painting demonstration of this deer and landscape. Hi, I'm Lisa, the artist behind La Cree Fine Art. Yeah, that's not done yet. He'll be done by the end of the video. I've got to finish him up tonight, but I needed to record the video today. I'm rambling, let's move on. So I painted this on a Fredericks Pro Series Belgian linen canvas, very, very smooth. And because I was going to be doing so much airbrushing for the background and so much blending and fine detail, this was a perfect canvas. This one is a 24 by 36 inch. My reference photo for the landscape comes from Pixabay. The reference photo for the deer comes from wildlifereferencephotos.com. I used Liquitex Basics acrylic paints along with Holbein airbrush paints. I will have links to the supplies I used below in the video description. If you are supporters over on Patreon, the two hour version of this tutorial is available for you now, complete with voiceover. So make sure to head over and check that out. Now we'll move on to this tutorial. I started by painting my canvas gray, and then I used a white charcoal pencil to sketch everything out. The reason that I go with the white charcoal pencil is that it erases completely. So it's really easy to draw something, realize you don't like it, erase it, move it. You won't have pencil lines like you would if you were using a regular graphite pencil. And I'm starting by airbrushing a white color. It's not completely white. I've added a little bit of raw sienna, or I'm sorry, raw umber, and a little bit of black in it. So I've got a, a gray tone. It looks white compared to the gray but it's not actually white white and you'll notice that once I start adding white onto this. Now I'm just blocking in my general lights and darks to keep everything easy just doing this all solid one color I will come back with the other colors later. If I had to switch back and forth if I was working on a tiny section and I'm constantly switching between the lights and the darks it's a little bit annoying to keep cleaning out the airbrush for that. So in this case it was just easier to block in everything with this medium tone on the sky and the mountains. So I'm coming back through with the oranges and pinks for the sky, and I'm going to cover a lot of this with clouds. It's not going to stay that yellow color that you're seeing now. Blocking in some of the brownish tones, it's more of, actually I'd say yellow ochre there, for the mountains. And that's another color that's not going to stay that way. I just need to bl start blocking in where these colors go. Now the trick when you want something to be somewhat out of focus when you're using the airbrush is not to let the airbrush get too close to the canvas. The closer you get, that's how you're going to get your fine lines. I don't want fine lines or harsh edges. I want, I'm okay with a lot of detail. I just don't want my edges to be sharp or harsh because that's what pulls it back into focus. So here, I basically get to use really bad airbrushing techniques and keep my hand a bit of, at a distance, not worry about keeping edges clean. I want everything to be fuzzy. And this is always a challenge for me when I'm painting because I want to tighten everything up. I want to make it look clean and complete all in its own rights. The thing is, I've got to remember if I do that, my deer is not going to stand out enough. So I have to keep reminding myself, no, don't add that much with the sharp edges, sharp lines. I want to keep my edges and my lines very, very soft, very out of focus. And you can see there's a ton of detail. It's not an issue of detail causing your backgrounds to look too sharp or too in focus if you're trying to get this look. It's an issue of your edges being too harsh. I can have high contrast. I can have a lot of detail. I just need a soft transition from one area to the next. Adding more highlights, and now as I've come through with the white, you can see the difference between that white versus what appeared to be white on my base layers. And when you build this up, it's going to look pretty terrible on your first several layers. You just want to keep layering until it looks good. And a lot of these Holbein acrylics that I'm using here are very opaque. Some of the blues and the blacks are more translucent. The white especially, very, very opaque. So it's going to cover everything very nicely. I'm going to go ahead and move on to the grass here. And I don't need these colors to be perfect. I can adjust those later on as I need to. What I need is to block in where my general shapes are going to go. And I'm just going to build up from there, adding some of these darks in the background here. And this is the same thing. I don't want a lot of harsh lines, harsh edges here. I want this to be very soft, very out of focus. And what you're seeing now, this is basically where the blurry portion will end. So I'm going to airbrush all of that and then I will switch over to painting everything by hand. Now this is an area that I'm going to come back through and add white over to create a foggy look. So I need the colors to be a little bit more bright, a little bit harsher than what I want my end result to be. So that when I come back through with the white, you can still see the green through that. If I went too muted, it's going to be that much more muted once the white goes on top. And none of this is completely finished. It's just loosely blocking things in. I'm going to come back through and do touch-ups later once I block in the deer and the flowers. 
getting some more of the darks here now on the mountains. One of the things that I love about airbrushing something like this, you're never fighting a dry time. And that's not something that you can really say whether you're using brushwork with acrylics or with oil. You can just keep painting and layering all you want. So here I'm blocking in where these stones are. This is going to be very loose, very messy. I am not at all worried about detail. That's actually one of the last details that I finish up on this painting. I just want to kind of block in where they go because I was having a hard time judging where my clumps and clusters with the flowers were supposed to go. So once those are in, I can use those as a sort of guideline to say, okay, three stones up is where the top of this flower cluster goes. It just makes it easier for me to keep track of what goes where. And it's not that the flower clusters need to be exact. No one's going to know the difference, but it does make it a lot less overwhelming to me when you look at it and go, oh my gosh, there are so many flowers. I don't even know where to begin. So here I can go, okay, the, the stones were easy enough. There's only a handful of those. I know three stones up is where this bunch of flowers start. So it definitely makes it feel less overwhelming if you can break it up like that and use other portions of your drawing to figure out where the next section is located or making sure that certain things line up. And I'm making sure that I get these red ridges in here on these rocks. Most of them you can see go horizontal. I don't want a ton of vertical lines. There's only one stone that has some somewhat diagonal lines going through it, but the most of these, the ridges are going to be horizontal. And this is going to help me keep my perspective going right. If I started doing a lot of these stones, if you've noticed how they're kind of stretched out in long ovals going horizontal, if I stretched those out to where they were more egg-shaped or oval going vertically, it will completely throw off the perspective. It's very important when you're you're drawing stones, if you're making a road, whatever it is that you're doing, you want to make sure any of your lines, your harsher lines like you've got here with the lines in between the stones, they want you want them to be horizontal so that you can really see the perspective there, so that it looks like things are flattened out and moving away from you at a distance. If you make them go oval where they're diagonal or more vertically, that is going to make it look more like a wall instead of a road moving back, or in this case, stones moving back. So as I build up my flowers and the grass in here, I start with a very, very dark color. With the flowers, I start with very dark magenta and then start adding a lighter shade and then another lighter shade on top of that. With the grass, I do the same thing. I started with the darks and then I start building up and adding highlights on top of that. Anytime I paint bushes or grass or trees, anything like this where I'm using this kind of spongy almost looking technique, then I'm going to do everything in a minimum of three colors. Whether Again, if that's trees, then I'm going to go with black or almost a blackish green, a lighter green, and then the lightest green. At least three, sometimes more than that. But I build it up in several layers like that, making sure that you can still see all of the previous layers through there in these clumps and clusters. As I paint these pink leaves or pink flowers, notice how you can still see the dark through it. I'm not just covering everything. When I do an additional layer, here where, where I went through with the lighter pink. I didn't just cover all of the medium pink or all of the dark pink. And that's something that I often see beginner students who are painting this style make is that they will put the dark layers down, then they put the medium layer on top of it, or each additional lighter color completely covers the color underneath. There's no clumps or clusters. Everything is just globbed on. It's really, really important that you see the lights and the darks, that you build clumps and clusters in order to make that look realistic. That's what will make it look realistic, not finding the absolute perfect pink. That's one of the things that people get so hung up on. I've gotta find the perfect color. My work will look more realistic if I put the right color in the right place. It's not so much about the color as it is the value. Remember that. Don't worry so much about the perfect pink, the perfect whatever color you're trying to do. It's the value. Get your darks dark enough, your lights light enough. That is what's going to make your work look more realistic, not finding the perfect color. So that, just get that out of your head when you think, okay, I just need to know the right color. Color does play a role, but it is not nearly as important as your values. Just remember that. Get your lights light enough and your darks dark enough and you'll be good. But in doing that make sure when you're layering like this that you don't overdo your lights on top of your darks so that you don't see the darks anymore. All of that needs to show through. I'm using a liner brush. This is a number one synthet synthetic hog haired liner brush and I've started with my base green and then I put highlights on top of portions of that. Now here's the important thing. The highlights on those greens, notice that it's not the entire strand. I don't take the highlight and go top of the, the blade all the way to the bottom of that blade of grass. I only want portions of it to have the highlight. That will make it look more realistic. Each individual blade of grass, I want to have lights and darks. It's really, really important. It's very much like drawing hair. You don't want each strand 
of hair to be one solid color. The light is going to catch on certain areas depending on how that hair, or in this case the grass, is bent. So look at how I've got portions with highlights and then portions of that same blade of grass are very dark. And the easiest way for me to make that happen is to paint them a medium tone, then add glazing to darken up portions of it, and then I come back on top with the highlights, as you've seen there with the liner brush. Now, everything that I'm doing here, you can see on the live stream, watch me work live. I know this goes very quickly, and when we get onto the next section of flowers, it's going to go very, very fast. So I will have a card pop up, and I'll put a link in the video description of the live stream so you can see me work on those flowers real time, where I show how I'm layering that. You can see I've got my darks here. Then I'm going to come on top with my darkest pink. Then I will come back on top of that with a shade lighter than that. Oh, in this case, I'm adding some green, but there's my lighter pink, and notice how it's only hitting portions. I'm not covering all of the dark pink. I'm mostly getting the, the top sections of these. Now I'm going to come on top with a shade lighter than that. And again, you can see all three of those shades there, the darkest pink, medium pink, lightest pink. And I'll even come on top with some lighter and darker areas from there. But it's a layering process, and it's very, very important that each layer shows up, that you can see all of those. I glazed a little bit of raw sienna over some of these flowers so that they weren't too pink. They were a little bit, I wanted them to be somewhat softer, so adding that raw sienna, toned them down a little bit. Thickening up these flowers. And if you have a bad layer when you're painting, don't freak out and feel like, oh my gosh, I ruined it. Because one of the, the other problems that I often see acrylic painters make is that they don't want to paint something. They'll do a layer. They think, wow, this looks good. I don't want to finish the painting because I'm afraid to mess it up. So I'm just going to leave it how it is now. If it's not pan finished, it's not good. It would be better to mess it up and learn from that than to leave something not quite finished. Don't be afraid. If you have a bad layer, it doesn't matter. Layer on top of it. Keep layering until it looks good, until it looks how you want it to. So coming back over here to these stones, I'm starting to add more detail, more highlights. And the main color that I'm using there is unbleached titanium white with a bit of Mars black. I only used titanium white for my brightest highlights. And even then I toned it down. It wasn't straight white. If I went straight white, your attention would be focused too much on those, those stepping stones. And that is not where I want the focus. So moving on to the deer here, I'm outlining his antlers. Now this is where I want sharp edges. I need those edges to be very clean, very sharp, and that's what makes them stand out against all of the detailing that I did in the mountains behind it. I'm blocking everything in with unbleached titanium white. I'm using a flat brush. This one is a Taclon bristled brush, and it's flat, so it gives me those nice crisp edges. I'm just going to block those in first, and then I can come on top of those with my shading. Highlights and shadows. So there's a little bit of a darker color there. Now these have a lot of lines, a lot of ridges in the antlers, and so I want to make sure that I keep my brush strokes within the antlers very sketchy. Those outer edges need to be sharp, no sketchy lines there. I don't want them to look fluffy, but I do want the intersections to be very sketchy, to have a lot of lines there. So I'll move the paintbrush back and forth to create those lines. Now I'm using a liner brush with a darker color. It looks like it's black. It's not straight black. I've actually got brown mixed in with it. Some highlights there with titanium white. Now I'm going to block in portions of the deer's face and I jump around while I wait for one area to dry. I can use a hair dryer and dry portions faster if I want to. But sometimes it's just easier to let one area dry and work on another while that other spot dries. So you'll see me jumping around a bit there. Using a liner brush for a lot of this and a smaller flat Taclon bristled brush. And I'm just blocking in my general shapes and shadows, where my lights and darks go. I am not too worried about the color. This color here is terrible. It is not, it's very dull. That is not how it's going to stay. What I need are my lights and my darks. I can glaze color on top of any of this. That's no problem. I just wanna pay attention to where my shadows, where my highlights, where my details go. And a lot of the shorter fur, the majority of what I do there are just dots. And I sketch in some of the fur lines, but not all. Don't feel like you have to put in every single line of fur. That's going to give you something that looks kind of like a zombie. It will not look natural. It won't look right. I want him to look shiny and like he's got a healthy coat. So I'll put in a few little strands of, of 
fur, but not too many. Don't overdo that. And that's a tip I can give you for any animal that you're drawing. I see people do that a lot. They'll paint a tiger and they'll try to put every strand of fur, but it looks very unnatural, very almost plasticky. Don't do that. You can have a lot of smoother clumps and clusters of the fur and just a few individual strands. That will look much more natural. Plus, it's a lot easier and a lot faster to paint it that way, which is just an added bonus. It's not that I want, I'm saying to paint it that way because it's faster. That's just a nice plus. Starting to shade in some other colors here. Taking that raw sienna, we'll be using that color a lot on this guy. You can see as I start glazing that over, his color becomes much more rich. And there's burnt sienna along with that. That is that reddish brown color. And those are the two main colors that I used on this, along with a little bit of magenta. I've got my titanium white, my unbleached titanium white, which I use more than titanium white, my black, and I'm going to use both Mars black for the opaque areas and ivory black for areas that I want to be very translucent for some of the shadows. And then my burnt sienna, raw sienna, I've got a little bit of Van Dyke brown, and then that magenta color. I call it magenta. It's actually, I want to say deep violet is the name of the paint. So this is the same thing, blocking in where my lights and my darks go. Now those spots I'm going to have to repaint in several times. The reason that I went ahead and painted them now is so that when I paint these translucent colors over it, I'm still going to be able to see where I want my spots to go. If I just paint it over the white charcoal, I will lose all of those spots and just have to guess or redraw them back in where I want them. So it was easier just to quickly paint those in white first. I'm paying attention to where my highlights, my shadows, and all of that go on this guy. That's really what my focus is, not on individual strands of fur. He would look way too fluffy if I did that. I want to move my paintbrush in the right direction for the fur, so when I do get those brush strokes, it just looks like it's fur. But I don't need to draw in every individual strand. Watch my shadows and watch my highlights. That's what matters here. Get my values correct. And you want to pay attention to where you put shadows and highlights. This is a mistake that I'll often see people make where they'll put the shadows and the highlights in the wrong area. You don't want to put highlights for the sake of putting highlights. You need to put the highlights in the right area because those determine what the underlying bone and muscular structure of that animal is. So if you put highlights and shadows in the wrong area, you can make them look very, very deformed. Make sure you're paying attention to that reference photo. And what I will do is if I've got a reference photo that doesn't have a lot of highlights and shadows, but I otherwise like it, I will look at what you can usually see some, just a slight bit of highlight and shadow on everything. It's not usually just going to be one solid color that would look flat. So if I can see some highlights, I just hype those up like crazy because those are going to be in the right location. They're just not as bright as I want. So you can hype those up with what little you see to give it a lot more dimension. And you can see here too, this is another area. You, it's not just an area of picking the right color and putting it in the right place. I've got to do a lot of glazing. I've got to pay attention to my highlights and my shadows. That is what's going to make it look realistic. Not finding the perfect shade of brown, the perfect shade of red. This, it, that doesn't matter so much. I mean, I could paint him purple. And because he has the shadows in the right place, that's still going to make him look semi-realistic assuming the background had purple in it too. It would just look like it's cast on his fur or the lighting was was shifted. But it's the the shadows and the highlights that matter. And here, look at that magenta. That's really pink. That's a lot more pink than one of these guys would naturally have. But that's what's going to give me a more natural look because I've still got those shadows and highlights. It's okay that I decided I need a brighter purple to make the color a little bit more rich or magenta, I should say. So adding my last dots on here, or last layer, I should say, just going over what I previously had to make them stand out a bit better. Some final highlights. Now, I did decide that I needed, in order to balance this piece out, I needed something else on the right-hand side. Originally, I thought I was going to paint light bulbs. Well, when I Photoshopped that in, it didn't look good at all. It just threw off the balance. So I needed something else to add weight there, but not be as big as light bulbs. So I ended up adding these little birds after I finished filming and it just balanced everything out much, much better. 
The last thing I did on this one, which is the same thing I do at the end of every painting, and I strongly recommend you guys do yourself, when you're working from reference photo, which most of us are going to be doing, put the reference photo away at the end. Once you've got everything blocked in, you know where the eyes go, the nose go, you have the highlights on the, the deer in the right place or whatever subject you're painting, put that reference photo away at the end, back away from your painting, and really look at it. What does your painting need to make it better? Do you need to add more flowers? I thickened up some of the flowers in some of the areas and thinned them down in other areas. I made some adjustments to the lighting on the deer, so it's not exact to my reference photo, but I made the changes based on what I felt would make my piece stronger as a whole, because that's what matters. It's not that we're using the reference photos and that we have to be a slave to that reference photo. We have to copy every single thing exactly, depending on what area it is. I mean, I want to make sure that my eyes are in the right place, that the nose is in the right place, the legs, everything like that. But as far as the, the contrast, the lighting, the shadows, that you can make adjustments on as needed. So put that reference photo at the away at the end and decide what your specific painting needs to make any final improvements. I'm definitely going to be using this guy for some of the upcoming Patreon postcards. Not sure what month that'll be for yet, but I will have prints available on my site too. So if you're not on Patreon and you wanted a print, that'll be over there. So I originally planned on doing this painting as two weeks because I knew that background was going to take forever. I thought week one would be the background, week two would be the deer. And then I realized that would mean three weeks in a row of acrylics. And then I felt bad because the colored pencil artists would be missing out on their week. So I decided to forego sleep and paint a lot. More so than normal to try to catch up and get this done in a single week, which is why it's not done yet. But it'll be done by the end of this, well, by the part you've seen this, now it's done. But it'll be done by the time this video goes live. Hey, have you subscribed yet? If not, I have a handy button right there that you can click on. It's round, has an orange arrow going to it, can't miss it. If you click that, it'll help you to keep up to date with all five of my new art videos every single week. It's a lot of videos. I have over 700 on this channel. That's a lot of videos. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Actually, I'll see you tonight for the live stream.